Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text for today is taken from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, the Gospel lesson. We pray, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, like I just said, that psalm we read, Psalm 19, that prayer I just prayed right before this sermon, which I pray often, is right out of Psalm 19, but also another prayer I pray about God's word is more precious than gold, sweeter than honey. Again, right out of Psalm 19. So we believe God's going to answer those prayers before these sermons, that these sermons will have an impact in your lives. Danielle, do you mind coming up and helping me with the sermon today? Danielle wants to show you this picture today and you know I know it's not Christmas but we have a Christmas picture because I want you to think about this fact that Jesus was born in a manger so take a look at this this common manger think about the fact that he was born in a stable for animals go ahead and go real close to people so they can see it okay and uh, it is incredible that the, the God of the universe the God who made everything who could have been born in the best palace was born in a manger in a stable. The humility of Christ is amazing. But also he was identifying with the poor. I mean, they couldn't have a place in an inn or someone's house because of the poverty of Jesus. And yet at the same time, he was buried in a rich man's tomb, showing that he cares for all people, the rich and the poor alike. But the problem in this world today is many times the poor are ignored and not very well taken care of. And we see that in our gospel lesson for today. As Jesus cleanses the temple, why was he so upset? Two reasons. We're going to talk about both, but one is the lack of care for the poor. Uh, as these people who were these religious leaders who were in charge of the temple were taking care of all this temple business and overcharging the poor, making it very difficult for them to worship the Lord. So let's take a closer look at our text then from John chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, making a whip out of cords, a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the auction, oxen. And he poured out the coins for the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, the first thing we notice, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus knew he was about to die by crucifixion. He knew everything that was going to happen to him. And so, if I was going to give Jesus some advice, I'd, I'd tell him, Jesus, don't, don't upset these religious people. You know, they're, they're, they're about to kill you. So just take it easy on them. But, you know, Jesus thinks completely different than us. And this shows us that the Bible truly is inspired by God because God thinks so different from us. And so Jesus abs absolutely upsets them by coming to the temple in this outer court where they had made it into a market and he gets rid of everything there he doesn't just tell him this is wrong he gets rid of all this stuff with a whip of cords again for two reasons one is he did have compassion for the poor we see that throughout the bible god's compassion for the poor and uh, what why is this related to the poor because from history we see that these Religious leaders were overcharging. For example, the way they do that is, say a poor person brought in his lamb for sacrifice, and uh, religious leaders would inspect it. They would find a flaw in that, maybe create their own flaw. And then they would say, well, this one's flawed. You can't sacrifice this one. But we have a nice lamb right here that you can buy from us and sacrifice this lamb. 
And so that way they could overcharge. And of course, the tables of the money changers, because they had to give this offering in a certain coin, and so they could exchange money for them, but again, they could overcharge in doing so. And so the point is, money became more important than the worship of God. And this is something that was very upsetting to Jesus, because God cares about the poor, because this was putting a barrier in the way of people getting to God because of this emphasis on money. And today, we have poor right here in Iowa. And, uh, you know, we who have good jobs, a lot of times we'll, we'll judge the poor and say, well, it's their own fault because they're lazy. But you know what? As you, as you uh, learn about people, uh, you find that there are certain circumstances that lead a person to be in a, in a difficult situation. You know, just like this uh, last, uh, last couple of weeks, there was a woman who, uh, because of her, the health of her son, she spent her, her time at the hospital because her son was, was very, had a terrible accident. And so she was taking care of him, so she, she couldn't work anymore. When she finally did get a job, she got a low-paying job, and this, this gas station won't allow her to work full-time, and the, the pay rate isn't that great either. So she wasn't able to make rent. And uh, she, even though she, she downsized to a smaller apartment, trying to be able to afford it, Anyway, so I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll give you $15 an hour. You can work 10 hours uh, cleaning up my house, uh, cleaning the church here. And um, so she did. But uh, at the same time, I encouraged her to apply at other places as well, where she did. And the good news is she, she worked that, that one day and um, only a couple hours or so. And then she got that job. She got a new job. And so her situation was taken care of. I mean, because it looked so desperate, so dark, you know, because I didn't know could I find 10 hours worth of work at my home. I said I'd give her 10 hours worth of work. I didn't know if I could find 10 hours worth of work for her to do. It looked so desperate. But then she got that job. And it is so wonderful that she's going to be taken care of now. And again, you wouldn't think there would be poor in America, but I, this... The situation she was going through and made it very difficult for her. The point is that we, we've got to find a way to help people. And uh, even though I, I couldn't figure out her whole solution, I couldn't get her, get her enough money to pay for her rent, you know, God came through. You know, but I, I also gave her groceries. I said, don't, don't spend your money on groceries because I, I volunteer at the, the mobile food pantry every month and Sometimes we have extra food, so I, I take that and put it in my home. And, and here was a perfect time. Now she needed it, so I was able to give her some food, as well as some groceries that we had in our refrigerator of our own. But the point is, she was helped in her time of need. And we cared for the poor as this church, because you're the one enabling me to be volunteering at the food pantry. You're the one enabling me to have time to meet these people in this community and to help them. The point is, there are ways that we can help the poor. The poor are obviously in this world, throughout this world, and even in our own state. And we can make a difference in their lives. We see that God cares for the poor. Jesus cares for the poor. And we want to care for them as well. But the second reason we see that Jesus was upset with what was going on is found right here in the scripture. Jesus said... Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. In other words, the focus was no longer on worshiping God. The focus was on this market, this house of trade that they had made the temple into. But we come to the Lord's house to worship him, to put our focus on God. And that is so important. What did Jesus say is the greatest commandment in Matthew 22? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So we want to put our focus on loving God. We're not going through some religious ritual. The whole point is to love God because that's what they had. They had a religious ritual. They had a business going. 
And what they had forgotten is why we're here in the first place. Why is the temple there in the first place? Because God wants to have a relationship with us. That's why we have this church building. God wants to have a relationship with us. And so we come here to worship the Lord. We put our focus on the cross. We put our focus on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. We want to make our love for God number one. Putting God first in our lives. And so Jesus wanted to make it clear that money was not number one. But God was to be Number one. You know, we see in Jesus' parable of the sower and the different kinds of soil how money can be a distraction from the Word of God and from what really matters. We see this in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Talking about the seed that was sown in these different kinds of soil. Still others like seed sown among thorns. Hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. You see, what happens is the word of God is sown in people's lives. But these thorns come up, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And so people put money first, above God. And this is what is happening there. The deceitfulness of wealth is choking out the word, choking out what really matters in life, choking out love for God. So we put God as number one above all else because of who he is. He is God Almighty, but also because of his amazing love for us to think that he put us first on the cross. He wasn't thinking of himself. He wasn't trying to get out of the cross. And so just, you know, be real gentle with these people who had no compassion for the poor, trying not to ruffle any feathers. No, he dealt directly with this problem, cleansing the temple. He was going to the cross, knowing that this action here led to his crucifixion. He was going directly to the cross. Why? Because of his love for you. Because though we are sinners, though so many times we put so many things above God, still, Jesus put us first. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose again from the dead. So now everyone who believes in Jesus Christ has forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Thank God for what Jesus did for us on that cross. Thank God that you are in heaven. You are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. And that love, that amazing love that Jesus has for us inspires us to love him even more. To love him who died for us. Now, these religious leaders, they were so upset. They, they wanted to know what authority he had to do this. Well, of course, he has the authority of God Almighty. He is God Almighty. But this is what happened in verse 18. So the Jews said to him, As a matter of fact, uh, Tim, can you flip to the next slide where we have the text? And then, one, uh, yeah, right there. Okay, back, back, back one. There we go, the second paragraph. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then, and you can flip to the next one, said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So what sign did he give to show us that he had authority to cleanse the temple? And this is what he said. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course he's talking about the temple of his body. For God had come to the earth 
and dwelled among us in the person of Jesus Christ. There was something greater than the temple there that day. It was Jesus Christ himself. And he said, destroy this temple. And that's exactly what they would do. They would crucify Jesus Christ. But in three days, he would raise up. He would rise from the dead in three days. And that's exactly what he did. Showing that he is God Almighty. Yes, this is the God we serve. God Almighty. We love him because of his great love for us. And we serve him. But you know what? There's sin in our lives. Just as Jesus cleansed this temple, we have to examine our lives. And we have to say, God, cleanse me. In our own church here, there's sin in our church. In our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, there's sin. In the church throughout the world, there's sin. We need a cleansing today. Back in 1517, Martin Luther saw the need for a cleansing in the church, and, and he spoke the word of God to cleanse that church. He spoke the truth of the gospel to cleanse the church in his day. But today, God's church needs cleansing as well. Let us pray for that. So I, I'm going to ask you right now to stand up and say a prayer. I will lead us in a prayer, asking God to cleanse our lives before, you know what? It all starts with us. We need a cleansing too. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you love us so much to give us forgiveness in eternal life. Thankful for what you've done for us. Now cleanse us. Even as you cleanse the temple, cleanse our hearts of any sin. Cleanse our church of any sin. Cleanse our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod of any sin. Cleanse your church throughout the world of any sin. That we might all together lead lives that bring honor to you. And help us to care for the poor as well. We ask in your precious name. Amen. And so, God is now working in us to bring forth good fruit in our lives. May we be like this soil. As Jesus said in Mark 4, verse 20, Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.